This tape chronicles an eastbound journey over the entire length of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin third rail electric interurban from both Aurora and Elgin toward the Chicago metropolis. In part one, we start at the tip of the lower leg of the wishbone on this map, Aurora, and take you up to the junction of the two legs at Wheaton. predecessors of the CA&E were a series of trolley lines, some originally horse-drawn, linking the cities of the Fox River Valley, Aurora, Batavia, Geneva, Elgin, and others north and south. Like most rural trolley lines, these declined into bus lines by the mid-twenties. The lines you see here, the high-speed third rail east-west raceway with its heavy rolling stock connecting Chicago with those same cities along the Fox was begun in 1901. Like in urbans everywhere in America, its rise was meteoric. And like most, it foundered just as quickly, shortly after World War I. But it continued running much longer than most right up to 1957, in fact, because it had developed its own captive suburban passenger market. It might be running still today, except for the Chicago's Congress Street Expressway. to Chicago was begun in 1901 in Aurora. It angled north to Wheaton and then swung east in a beeline for Chicago in connection with the Metropolitan West Side Elevated near 52nd Street. Its final terminal was Well Street in downtown Chicago, where it was eventually connected to the Loop. The first trip was made in August 1902. Departure from both Aurora and Elgin originally began in the center of each city. Until 1939, third rail trains from Chicago to Aurora put up their trolley poles at the edge of town and used the city car tracks all the way to Maine and Broadway. They shared downtown tracks with three other interurban lines and the local trolleys. At that time, Aurora was the second busiest trolley center in Illinois. When these pictures were made, both Aurora and Elgin had departure points removed from the center of town. Although in each case, for safety reasons, operation continued to be by trolley to the outskirts. At the outset, the CANE generated its own power at a coal-fired generating station in Batavia, Illinois. 25 cycle power was sent the length of its own line at 26,000 volts and stepped down to 600 at substations. Initially, the company supplied other trolley lines and surrounding communities with power. When 60 cycle power became standard, the generating station was discontinued and power purchased from public utilities. This is Batavia Junction, looking east. The line on your left from Batavia joins the main from Aurora on the right. The car approaching is headed for Aurora. The interchange with the Elgin, Joliet, and Eastern is just beyond. Although ridership soared during World War I, 
the legislature would not allow fare increases, and by 1919, the railroad could not meet the interest charges on its debt, and the line went into receivership. It was purchased by a group headed by Dr. Thomas Conway in 1922. Improvement began immediately. Steel passenger cars were ordered, much of the line was rock ballasted, and automatic block signals were installed. Insol acquired the line in 1926, only to lose it during the Great Depression. Following the Depression and through World War II, traffic continued to mount, with as many as three trains, a local, a limited, and an express, departing within 30 minutes of each other from downtown Chicago. At one time, all three were scheduled for departure at the same time, as many as 21 cars. The eight-car first section, the Cannonball, as it was known, ran nonstop Chicago to Wheaton, 25 miles in 41 minutes. Before the Depression, Sunday outings were the railroad's largest source of traffic. The railroad built Glenwood Park on the outskirts of Batavia. Six and eight car trains, direct from the Metropolitan Transit System, ran nonstop to the picnic grounds at the park. It was not unusual for the park to handle 120 carloads of passengers on a single Sunday. are now arriving Wheat, a junction with a line from Elgin. We passed first through the yard, the chief storage point for all Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin rolling stock, and by the shops where all maintenance and repair work was done. We slow as we approach the Wheaton passenger station and prepare to couple to the waiting 450 series car ahead. During slack periods, the waiting car left Elgin at exactly the same time as our car left Aurora. A minute after our arrival at Wheaton, the two will leave together as a Chicago Express. Elgin is the first station on the upper leg of the Y shown at the far left of the map. Now we're going to backtrack to Elgin, Illinois and show you an eastbound run from there to Wheat. We leave Elgin along the Fox River. Once again, city running is by overhead wire. Elgin was two miles further from Wheaton than Aurora, and each line had 12 stops. During busy times of the day, the Elgin car was allowed an extra two and sometimes four minutes to make its run to Wheaton.
Notice the right of way in many scenes appears to be offset. In this case, the tracks are closer to the poles on the right, and a flat space separates them from the poles on the left. Had the CANE become the success for which its original builders hoped, there was room in this space to double track the two legs of the Y from Wheaton to Aurora and Elgin. one of two interchange points with the Elgin, Joliet, and Eastern. Car 430, shown here, built by the Cincinnati Car Company in 1927, was the last of the real heavyweights, over 100,000 pounds. The Octavia line was discontinued. Passengers were bused to Lakewood by the railroad. Car 419 was one of the first group of all steel cars. Built by Pullman in 1923 and geared for 72 miles an hour. They are best remembered today largely because they were the first engineered specifically for the CA and E. They could not be coupled with the older wooden cars and, as a consequence, always ran together. In 1904, the railroad offered parlor car and dining service. Unlike the South Shore, where dining service was a success, most rides were too short for more than a single meal service, and despite comfortable wicker chairs arranged singly on each side of the aisle, the service did not flourish. The CANE had four parlor buffet cars, two from the turn of the century and two purchased in 1923. All were rebuilt to coaches in 1929. <laughs> 
crossing the DuPage River. The main line of the Chicago Northwestern appears to the left. The two roads ran almost parallel between Wheaton and Maywood. A four-car special is just pulling out of the Wheaton station. Note the white flags. After 1953, when service to downtown Chicago was discontinued, there was a surplus of cars. The timetable did not provide enough movements to lay up cars through the midday. Extra cars were returned to Wheaton without passengers carrying white flags. In part three, we've joined the traffic from each leg of the Y, and you're now on the busy main of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin, eastbound from Wheaton to Chicago. 403 is another Pullman product from 1923. In the 1930s, all cars were run through the turning loop at Wheaton once a month. The idea was to equalize wear on the wheels and the exterior paint. Back at Glen Ellen had space for seven freight cars, the busiest on the entire line. The only other siding with space for seven cars was just west of Wheaton. The industry there was golf. The stop was called Chicago Golf, and the weekend specials from the city kept it well filled. The four-car train arriving is headed by 318, a Jewett product, all wood, built in 1914 and later sheathed in steel. Freight service began with newspaper deliveries in 1903. Milk trains followed in 1905. But the road was paralleled for much of its length by the Chicago Northwestern. This made it difficult for the CA&E to generate much online traffic. As long as the cars originated in downtown Chicago, LCL shipments were carried in the motorman's compartment. Six steeple cab electrics sufficed to handle the carload freight. The first two acquired in 1921 are shown here. A four-car freight train was typical. These are 44 tonners built by GE. In 1926, a pair of more powerful 50 tonners was purchased from Baldwin Westinghouse. We'll see them later. The final pair, not shown in this tape, were 72 tonners, bought fourth hand from the Cedar Rapids Railroad in 1955. These were originally built for the Oklahoma Railroad some 26 years earlier.
passenger is setting the hand actuated stop sign for the flag stop at Green Valley. The timetable listed times at every station for the local trains, but they didn't stop unless passengers were waiting. The 451 460 series cars built by St. Louis Car Company and delivered in 1945 were the last built for the CA&E. Although they looked much the same on the outside as their predecessors, they had many changes. The weight was cut to 43 tons, about the same as the wooden cars built 40 years earlier. Street Expressway was built. Through trains to Chicago were discontinued, and two loops were built at Forest Park so that passengers could interchange with the CTA, Chicago Transit Authority. This was intended only as a temporary measure. Both CTA and Aurora trains would eventually use the median strip of the expressway. An elaborate relocation of the CA&E was built in the De Plain First Avenue area. Heavy rail, rock ballast, block signals, and a brand new bridge across the De Plain River. But none were ever used. The sticking point was terminal facilities for the Aurora Line in downtown Chicago. There was insufficient space to store cars, and the rapidly increasing passenger load on the CTA with its many intermediate stops spelled congestion. The last car ran from downtown Chicago on September 20, 1953. By Christmas of that year, half of the passengers had deserted the Aurora Line. Most had transferred to the parallel Northwestern Line. Up until the 50s, the only passenger trains on the Northwestern Line were the high-stepping streamliners that came bombing down the main on their way to the UP and the West Coast. After the demise of the Aurora, this became one of the three major commuter divisions of the Northwestern. The railroad filed several times to abandon passenger service, but it was not until the morning of July 3rd, 1957, that they received a favorable ruling. Service stopped at noon that day, and those who rode the Aurora to work that morning had to find other ways home that night. Some charter trips were run after that, and freight service continued twice daily until 1959. Full abandonment was not granted until 1961.
We are coming to the end of our eastbound trip. As these pictures were taken, the end of the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin was also in sight. are entering the loop that interwove with that of the CTA at Forest Park. A CTA train is waiting on the right to pick up inbound Chicago passengers. It will whisk them down the center of the Congress Street Expressway in 21 minutes, 14 minutes faster than they could have made it the old way. Mm -hmm.